Hello and welcome to GameSec. That's right, this time I'm taking a look at games made using the claymation technique, which of course means that I need to be made out of clay for this episode too. It would just be dumb if I were a boring human for this episode, don't you think? Anyway, animating this is tedious and it's taking forever, so let's get to the games. First up is The Neverhood, sometimes known as Neverhood Chronicles on PC, which was released in 1996 by DreamWorks and developed by The Neverhood. No, the game didn't develop itself. It was also released on the PlayStation, but only in Japan, and it's the same, but it looks quite a bit chunkier and darker. So yes, I'm actually playing a PC game on a real PC. Somebody somewhere just lost a bet. You play as a claymation character called Clayman, and you wake up in a room that you're locked in, and basically you have to point and click your way to freedom. That's right, a point and click adventure. I love these. Basically, you need to solve both minor and major puzzles in each area to move on. There are often items that you can move around, as well as buttons to push and levers to pull. There are things to collect as well, which you store inside your little clay body. What's cool is that you don't need to manage your inventory. If you click on something that can be used with an item that you have, you'll automatically pull the item out of your chest and use it, which is nice. Most areas are connected with this hub world type of place. This is represented with full motion video and you click to move to a different area, slowly. It reminds me of Mist or The Seventh Guest as this was the hot new thing that we were supposed to marvel over back then. It looks pretty grainy, but keep in mind that this is from 1996. That's how the world actually looked back then. The puzzles are often nonsensical, but still interesting. And of course, there's a slide puzzle. I absolutely hate slide puzzles. But I stuck with it and persevered. The character designs are great and done by Earthworm Jim creator Doug Tenable. I love the way Clayman moves as he walks around. There's lots of great claymation in here as you play and also in cutscenes. Mmm, this looks delicious. But be sure you don't eat three of these. I'm serious, just saying. I also love the clay texture, which is on everything, of course. It just looks so interesting visually. The music was done by a gentleman named Terry Taylor, and it's pretty silly stuff, just like the game itself. This is a really fun point and click game with a few tedious puzzles here and there, but it's worth it to solve them just to see what's next. It's just so silly, and I always want more games like this. Two years later, we got Skull Monkeys, which is a PlayStation exclusive. Yeah, we mentioned this game over seven years ago, but it really needs to be in this episode for obvious reasons. Story-wise, it's a direct sequel to The Neverhood, and once again, you play as Clayman. It's a side-scrolling action platformer now, and it's mostly pretty darn good. You kill enemies by jumping on them, but be careful. You die with a single hit. There is a little halo you can grab, which will let you take one more hit, though. There are also a lot of special items to grab, which can give you gun blasts, homing attacks, or things like that. But mostly, you'll be grabbing these little balls of clay. Once you get 100 of them, well, that's right, you get an extra life. And you'll need them, because your hitbox is certainly not tiny. The last half or third of the game is populated by insects instead of skull monkeys. This is where the game gets kind of annoying. You see, these floating guys can't be jumped on. Touch them and you die. And they are all over the place making your life difficult. That's right, this game is pretty tough, but you do have unlimited continues and a password feature. Each area has lots and lots of levels. In fact, I'd say the game as a whole might even have too many levels for its own good. But like I said, there's a password feature, so thankfully you don't need to play it all in one sitting. There's only a few times in the game where you'll actually fight a boss. They can be pretty tricky at first. Like here, where you fight Drake, even though he was only 14 years old when this game was made. He gets tougher and tougher after each hit you land on him. Still really fun though. The visuals are excellent, and both you and all of the enemies are very well animated. Not to mention the really cool scrolling that's everywhere. Sometimes there are even claymation cutscenes that are just as silly as the Neverhood, maybe even more silly, and I love them. The FMV quality here is great, so they're not grainy at all. Terry Taylor is back doing the music, and it's outstanding. Most stages start with a very basic tune that's added on as you get to new levels in the same area. Like 
In my opinion, the music and the claymation are the big selling points here. As a game, it's not bad. It's not one of the best 2D platformers out there, and it's certainly not among the worst. But it has quite a bit of personality, as well as a great presentation. This is Armacrog, which was initially released in 2015 after a successful crowdfunding campaign. It's available for the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Mac, PC, Linux, and even the friggin' Wii U. Doug Tenaple and a lot of people from the first two games are back for this one, and it's a spiritual sequel to The Neverhood. It has a story, I guess, which is kind of sung to you in the beginning, but I can't really understand what's going on. All I know is that I'm trying to save the universe, and instead, I crash land on some planet. It's just how it goes, you know? Of course, pretty much everything is made of clay, including yourself and your dog-like companion. We return to the same kind of point-and-click style of gameplay that we saw in The Neverhood. It's pretty simple to get the hang of. You just click where you want your dude to walk. You can click the dog to control where he goes as well. Sometimes he can get into small openings that you can't. If there's something you can interact with in some way, the mouse cursor will turn into a hand icon, which I've got to say is an improvement over The Neverhood, where the icon never really changed. If you pick up an item, you just pop it into the cavity of your clay chest, similar to Clayman in the original game. The inventory works the same way here in that you'll automatically use an object if you click on something that can use it. As you can see, the game is essentially once again just a bunch of puzzles that you need to solve in order to get to the next puzzle. For example, your dog friend will see these icons at three different parts early on in the game. It's completely random which icons they are, it'll be different for you than it was for me. Once you put those same symbols in on this puzzle in the proper order, you can press the button to open the door. The puzzles generally aren't difficult to figure out, and fortunately you have all the time in the world to do it. There are some tough ones though. And I've got to be honest, it is a bit fatiguing solving some of these puzzles. I get kind of bored with them. So honestly, it's not a game I can play for long periods in a single sitting. That in no way means it's bad though. Some of the puzzles might have you scratching your head when you first see them, like this one that shows up when the baby you find starts to cry. I'm not sure exactly what I did to solve it, but eventually I did. And yes, of course, there's even a slide puzzle in here, but amazingly, this one didn't piss me off at all. In fact, dare I say it, was almost kind of fun? Maybe because it wasn't too complex for its own good. The visuals are outstanding, and I love the way this game looks. Of course, that extends to the animation as well. There are quite a few cutscenes which have a lot of humor. Granted, it can be pretty lowbrow humor, but I still like it. And I also like the colors, the kooky designs, and just how crisp and clear everything looks, especially after playing The Neverhood. The claymation is enhanced with a few computer effects like warping, scaling, rotation, stretching, or overlays of fog or smoke. However, your character's movements aren't quite as expressive as Clayman's were in The Neverhood. The music is once again done by Terry Taylor, and it's some really good stuff. But I have to admit that I'm kind of disappointed that it doesn't sound as silly or as stupid as the previous two games. It doesn't quite have the same personality. All said and done, this is a good point-and-click adventure, and I like it quite a bit. If you like these kinds of games, then you certainly can't go wrong here. Okay, I've got to be honest, the trilogy of the Neverhood games is really as good as it gets when it comes to claymation. But that doesn't mean there aren't other good games using this visual style and they deserve a little attention. And again, we need to go back to the PC for these games. Well, this first one I'm playing on a Mac, which itself is a PC. Bite me.
This one is called the Dream Machine from Cockroach Incorporated and the Sleeping Machine. It's available only on the PC and Mac via Steam. This is another point and click adventure and it's definitely more story oriented than anything. You play a creepy looking dude named Victor. You start out on a beach and you're gathering things up just trying to survive. Lots of things conveniently seem to be there for you to discover. You eventually dig a hole and discover an alarm clock. Your alarm clock. It was all a dream. And that's the entire game, the end. Just kidding, obviously. You and your wife have just moved into a new apartment and it's pretty creepy. But the creepiest thing about this entire game may be your wife. Oh my God, look at her. Jesus, frightening. The game controls are fairly simple. You can just click where you want Victor to move to and what you want him to interact with. Your inventory lives at the top of the screen and you can drag objects in an attempt to use them with whatever you drag them to. There's a fair amount of dialogue in this one and the default setting lets you simply click the mouse to advance. I like that. Anyway, not only did you have a creepy island dream, but your pregnant wife tells you about a creepy dream that she had as well, which involved your landlord. Hmm. Basically, you move around your apartment building gathering items, figuring out what to use where in order to advance the game along. It's hardly difficult at all. However, you eventually find a machine under one of your floorboards which itself is a puzzle that you need to solve. It's not that bad. Once you do solve it, you find that a camera is pointing right at your bed, which of course creeps out your wife. You suspect the landlord because he had full access to the place before you moved in. You get down to his room to confront him about it and he's gone. The game takes place over six chapters full of dreams and you can buy the full game right now for about 20 bucks. They were released between 2010 all the way up to 2017. The visuals definitely have a unique aesthetic and I kind of like it. They use lots of clay but also cardboard to give it an interesting look. Unfortunately, there's not a ton of animation here other than just walking around and picking stuff up, but it still looks good. The music is constantly playing and it lends to the creepy atmosphere as well. Overall, it's a fairly intriguing game with a slightly mature storyline. Here's one called Nux, and it's on the PC as well as mobile devices from KISS Limited. This is a vertical shooter from 2006, and as you can see, everything is made out of clay. I'll be honest, you can tell right away that this was targeted to be a mobile game. You only have to worry about moving and holding down your fire button. I wouldn't be surprised if it fired automatically if you play it on your phone. It seems like a normal shooter, and you can even get a more powerful shot. Unfortunately, these power-ups are timed and the game feels the need to explain how to play it each and every time, even though it couldn't be more simple. How dumb do the developers think people are? Well, actually people are kind of dumb, so they probably do need this stuff. The first stage ends in a big boss fight. Get past that and suddenly you're going down, trying to softly land on pads to refuel. You also need to be careful not to touch anything. This is very difficult to play with a controller. It probably plays much better with a touch screen. Still, after a few tries at this, I kind of lost interest in the game. The stop motion visuals and even the music are so much better than the gameplay. Sadly, these visuals can also make it tough to see enemy fire sometimes. It's too bad, this could have been a really good game. Much better claymation shooter is Platypus by Anthony Flack and Squashy Software. This one is available on a slew of PCs, mobile devices, even the PSP and Xbox 360. I'm playing on the PC using Steam here. This one's a horizontal shooter and I've always felt that horizontal shooters as a rule are much more interesting than vertical ones. And while this certainly doesn't rank up there with the best of them, it's still pretty fun. As you're flying around shooting things, certain enemies will sometimes fly in and if you destroy them, they'll leave behind a power-up star. 
You can shoot this star to change its colors and each color is a different weapon. Virtually any of these are more desirable than your base weapon. Unfortunately, they're all on a timer. Many enemies will absorb a lot of bullets before they die, which can make this one feel kind of tough. You do start with a bunch of lives and when you continue, you don't get set back at all, so they do give you a little bit of a break. You'll die a lot as it can be pretty tough to avoid enemy fire. Often ships will come from behind you for no other reason than to make sure you don't hang out on the left edge of the screen. That part kind of feels cheap to me. Also, some groups of enemies stand no chance of being totally destroyed before they exit the screen if you only have your base weapon. I don't care for that either. Lastly, when some things blow up, they'll drop items that you can grab for points. I recommend avoiding these because you'll likely die trying to get them because you're going to confuse an enemy bullet as something you can grab. Other than that, the game is pretty fun. There are only four levels, but they are all really long, with five areas each, and you'll see some changes as you make your way through them. The graphics all look really good with tons of parallax scrolling. Supposedly, the creator only had one giant piece of clay that he used to create everything in the game. He then just changed the colors in Photoshop. The music is really good, and I've heard that these are arranged versions of various Commodore 64 games. I couldn't tell you if they are or not, but I can tell you that everything here is extremely enjoyable to listen to. Overall, it's a fair game. Five years later, we got Platypus 2. The original creator wasn't involved with this one. Still, it's basically more of the same and all of the enemies return here. You won't be seeing a lot that's new other than the backgrounds. I do like how the enemies splash into the water when you shoot them down though. To be fair, this one offers three players simultaneous instead of just two. It also allows you to pick the style of your ship's power-ups you want, kind of like Gradius. And now there are even some power-ups that aren't on a timer, like these spinning options you can get if you can find them. Other than that, it feels mostly like an expansion pack of the first game. Alright, now for the console games which are probably the ones you had in mind when you first saw the title of this episode. Am I saving the best ones for last? Well, let's find out right now. I'm sure you expected Clay Fighter to show up in this episode, and here it is. It was released in 1993 on the Super Nintendo by Visual Concepts and Interplay. It was also ported to the Genesis in 1994. This came out during Street Fighter II Mania and they decided that using claymation would help this game stand out. And it really did stand out back when it was released. Basically, you're fighting to become King of the Circus. You can choose to play as one of eight different characters who were all sculpted out of clay. The controls are set up like Street Fighter 2, so if you're familiar with how that one plays, this one will be pretty easy for you to get into. Of course, each character has a variety of silly moves and even a few special moves. When it comes down to it, it's an average game at best. As you work your way through the stages in the single player mode, you'll come across a couple of repeat fights. You need to defeat both Tiny and Taffy twice. I think this was done just to extend the length of the game a little. What's weird is that the fights begin without notice, sometimes even before the announcer is finished talking. Ichiban Clay versus Bad Mr. Frosty. The graphics are okay. I've got to be honest here and say that only the blob actually looks like he's made out of clay. I think the number of colors on screen are just too low to reproduce clay very well. And yes, the Genesis version looks even worse. And the animation isn't so hot either. The music wouldn't even be worth mentioning if it weren't for the cool theme song on the title screen. That's pretty cool for a 16-bit cartridge game. You didn't hear stuff like this very often back then. It 
It wasn't long before Clay Fighter Tournament Edition was released on the Super Nintendo. This one was only available to rent at Blockbuster Video, at least in North America. You couldn't buy it. This is basically just an update of the first game that fixes some of the glitches and bugs. But a longer intro was added, which explains the story a lot better. A tournament mode was also added. There also seem to be more voices coming from the announcer. And the backgrounds have all been updated. Other than that, well, it's just Clay Fighter. Clay Fighter 2 Judgment Clay came out exclusively for the Super Nintendo in 1995. First up, the visuals are way better since they used a lot more colors and a megabyte more memory. They also redid the animations of all of the returning characters. However, they cut out a bunch of fighters from the original game and replaced them with other fighters that really aren't very interesting. As a game, I feel it's worse than the original because it's too unbalanced in the single player mode. My thumb was hurting after each and every match, which means I was pressing way too hard on the pad. And I only suffer from this on bad fighting games. I didn't enjoy playing this one much at all. At least the tournament mode is built in so you don't have to worry about running down to Blockbuster Video for a cash grab. Oh, and the announcer actually calls out when the fight starts this time. Round one, fight! Like I said, the visuals have improved a lot here, but sometimes the foreground objects get in the way as you fight. Who thought that was a good idea? The music definitely sounds better here, but again, it's nothing special. Overall, it's not really something I'd recommend, at least not in single player mode. In 1997, we got Clay Fighter 63 and a third on the Nintendo 64. Get it? Because so many N64 games have the 64 suffix? Ha ha ha? Anyway, this one is a huge improvement. You don't have a ton of characters to choose from like you'd expect from a fighting game in 1997, but Ichibod Clay is back and I enjoyed using him in the first game. Another new addition is Earthworm Jim, who almost controls like Ken from Street Fighter Alpha in some ways. There are three hidden characters, one of which is Boogerman. Yay, Boogerman, so exciting. The game is a 2D fighter played on a 3D background which rotates as you fight. What's cool is that there are a lot of hidden areas you can discover by crashing through certain walls and doors. This adds a lot of variety to each fight. The control is still set up Street Fighter style, so you'll be using the yellow buttons on the N64 controller for most of this one unless you're partial to the weaker attacks. It feels fine though. The game is no longer divided into rounds, you just need to drain both of your opponent's life bars. I've got to say that this one is much easier than the first game on its normal difficulty setting, so be sure to increase it a little before you begin. The graphics are pretty good here, as memory wasn't much of an issue. However, the fighters don't seem to have much detail in them, and they are kind of blurry. They look more like goo instead of clay. They almost look like the sprites were designed to be really small and just upscaled with a blur filter. And the game itself is very, very dark. The sound is pretty good and there are always a ton of voices going on which may or may not annoy you. What's cool though is the people that they got to supply the voices like Frank Welker, Dan Castellaneta, Rob Paulson, and more. You'll hear them all quite a bit. There was a version of this planned for the PlayStation called Clay Fighters Extreme, but it was never released. Overall, this one is a fun and silly fighting game. The final Clay Fighter game is Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut for the Nintendo 64. For this one, Interplay went back to their blockbuster video exclusive ways which everyone loves. That means this is one of the most expensive games on the console since it's so incredibly rare. And once again, this rental version is a simple update to the game that preceded it. They added an intro with some singing. They also added quite a few characters. Some of them are hidden behind codes for some reason. The game is also a bit more difficult now. Overall, I feel that this one is the best Clay Fighter game, though not worth the price. Take 
Last up is Claymates, released by Interplay on the Super Nintendo in 1994. This one is a side-scrolling platformer. You're a small blue ball of clay and your main attack is the little fist that pops out when you press the attack button. You can jump and do all of that stuff, but you die with a single hit. However, since you're a piece of clay, you can merge with different balls of clay. Depending on what color you merge with, you'll become a different animal. Each animal has their own style of attack and different abilities. For example, when you're the cat, you can walk vertically up trees. Get hit once though, and you turn back into the little blue ball of clay. Your goal is to collect tons of jewels and make it to the end of the stage, most of which are way too long and get very boring. If you collected enough stuff, you can go to a bonus stage. It's a simple concept, but I love it. I don't know, maybe I'm just a sucker for when the scaling feature is used. Between each level is an overworld where you need to manipulate things in order to clear a path to the next overly long side-scrolling stage. Honestly, this is another game where it really doesn't look like clay. Like, at all. Seems like a waste. The background graphics are generally sparse and unappealing. The music is technically impressive as it's extremely crisp and vibrant. I ended up becoming disinterested in this one pretty fast. I look forward to never playing it again. And there you go, a bunch of interesting games all made with clay, at least to some degree. It really is a striking art style, especially when it's done right. And what you're looking at right now is definitely not a good example of doing it right. I mean, just look at me here. Anyway, I'm quite positive I didn't cover all of the Claymation games, so be sure to mention any others that I should check out. Let me know, and in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. I'm never paying that blue guy back, man. He ripped me off. Hey, man, I'm here for that money. I don't have it, man. We'll take this and that and this and that and this. <laughs>